lot of people, and uh, it's been difficult for people to get back into a regular mode again, so we, we really are delighted to have you here tonight. At this time, I would like to introduce Sherry Litwack. She's the former president of the Friends, and she will introduce the program and the award. Last year, the library received a letter from a Concord resident, Richard Miller, offering us an opportunity to present an award to an American historian. The Ruth Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History was established in 1998 and named for Mr. Miller's mother, who believed, who believed understanding history was not merely desirable, but a civic and religious duty. Ruth Ratner Miller exemplified this belief as an original member of the Holocaust Commission and founding member of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Mr. Miller's only request was that the award be used to support and promote the library, since he fundamentally understands that the library is more than a repository of books. It is a repository of our history, as well as a center for contemporary knowledge, a true community center. It seemed particularly fitting for the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library to present this award, since it is the mission of the Friends to expand the role of the library by offering programs to the community that stimulate and inspire. Our program tonight is a perfect example of how the Friends strive to fulfill this mission. And now, to begin the evening's program, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Michael Sandel is professor of government at Harvard University, where he's taught political philosophy in the Faculty of Arts and Science, Sciences since 1980. He teaches courses on contemporary political philosophy, the history of political thought, and the American political tradition. His undergraduate course, Justice, typically enrolls 700 to 800 students. Dr. Sandel is author of Democracy's Discontent, America in Search of a Public Philosophy, a book that has sparked much discussion about the American political and constitutional tradition and its relevance for contemporary public life. Dr. Sandel has lectured widely in North America, Europe, Japan, and Australia to academic and general audiences. In 1998, he delivered the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Oxford University, and this fall will deliver a series of lectures at the University of the Sorbonne. Dr. Sandel is also a member of the Board of Trustees of Brandeis University, the National Constitution Center Advisory Panel, the Shalom Hartman Institute of Jewish Philosophy in Jerusalem, and the Council on Foreign Relations. A summa cum laude Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Brandeis University in 1975, he also received his doctorate from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. The, Car the Carnegie Corporation recently named him one of the 12 Carnegie Scholars nationwide in support of his work on the moral limits of markets. It is my pleasure to present Michael Sandel. It's an honor to be here on this occasion uh, to join in honoring Daniel Boorstin, one of the great American historians of our time. And the subject of my talk um, is the democratic experience in America, what has become of it. And the phrase, the democratic experience, is borrowed from this work of Daniel Borston, part of his series on the Americans, this volume on the democratic experience, where he really sets out the, um, the way in which the democratic experience in 20th century America took form. I'd like to begin with two moments. One of the moments has to do with a change in the way Americans understood themselves around the turn of the century, about a hundred years ago. And that moment is described with eloquence and clarity in Daniel Borston's work. 
And the moment had to do with the advent of what Orston calls communities of consumption. Here's how he describes a change that took place around the turn of the century. Invisible new communities were created and preserved by how and what men consumed. The ancient guilds of makers, the fellowship of secrets and skills and traditions of fabricating things, were outreached by the larger, more open fellowship of consumers. No American transformation was more remarkable than these new American ways of changing things from objects of possession and envy into vehicles of community. And then he goes on to describe how chain stores such as the A&P, Woolworth, Walgreens, mail order houses such as Montgomery Ward and Sears, brand names such as Borden's, Campbell's, Del Monte, and Morton's Salt, all of these brands bound countless Americans together in new communities of consumption. Quote, now men were affiliated less by what they believed than by what they consumed. Men who never saw or knew one another were held together by their common use of objects so similar that they could not be distinguished even by their owners. These consumption communities were quick. They were non-ideological. They were democratic. They were public and vague and rapidly shifting. Never before had so many men been united by so many things. End quote. Orston goes on to acknowledge that the new consumption communities were shallower in their loyalties, more superficial in their services than traditional neighborhood communities, but they were nevertheless ubiquitous, somehow touching the American consumer at every waking moment and even while he slept. So here we have this wonderfully vivid account of the emergence at the turn of the century, about a hundred years ago, of a new basis of community and of shared identity in America. Now, what I would like to talk about tonight, and by invoking this account from Daniel Borston's history, I don't mean to saddle him necessarily, necessarily with the expectation that he'll agree with what I have to make of this. But what I would like to suggest is that this moment, the advent of communities of consumption 100 years ago, was a decisive moment in the unfolding of the American democratic experience. That it foretold something important about the course that democracy in America would take and has taken and that the consequences for democracy of this new understanding of community have not been altogether good or desirable for the democratic project. So that's the general account I want to try to give. But before I turn to the historical account and then the interpretation of what's become of the democratic experience, I would like to address another moment. These days it's the unavoidable moment, September 11. Most every commentator struggling to grasp the enormity of the terrorist attack in the World Trade Center has said that something fundamentally is changed by this attack. America is no longer as it was. And there are many ways in which these events have changed and will have changed us, most of which we can only begin to articulate. But there are two striking ways in which the events of September 11 have changed the way we think and talk about politics. 
and I'd like to mention them briefly. The first is the obvious outpouring of patriotism, a sense of national community and solidarity, the unembarrassed assertions of national purpose and pride. And a second, partly related shift, striking fact about the response to the events of September 11, has to do with a, a renewed appreciation of public institutions. Who are the heroes of this event? They're the police officers, the firefighters, the rescue workers, they're government employees. And the picture of the federal government, the image of the federal government now, is different from what it was before September 11th. We've just lived through a period, the last two decades, roughly speaking, when the federal government and its primacy and its importance and its legitimate role has been called into question. The Supreme Court has tried to revive federalism and state sovereignty as a doctrine of constitutional law. Even a democratic president announced that the era of big government had ended. Public opinion surveys showed that people's trust in the federal government had sunk to all-time lows. Back in the 1960s, when pollsters asked, do you trust the federal government to do the right thing most of the time? Three-fourths of the people said yes. By the 1990s, almost three-fourths of the people said no in answer to that question. And they asked the same question that they've been testing now for, for, for over 40 years. In the wake of these events, 64% now trust the federal government to do the right thing. Returning almost to 1960s level, pre-Vietnam, pre-Watergate levels of trust in the federal government. It's a striking side effect of these attacks. Now we've been living it with the end, with, with the era of big government over, what's filled its place has been the impulse to privatize, to celebrate the private sector in individual initiatives, subcontracting. Private industry can do better what government has tried and failed to do. That's been the argument, the drift, the thrust of political discourse in the 1980s. But now we see that people are saying, you can't rely on the private sector to patrol the security checkpoints in airports. We should federalize, this is the call by many in Congress and across the political spectrum, we should federalize. The federal government should be doing that, not the private sector. So there's a reversal of the impulse that's driven American political discourse about the federal government. Now, on one level it's easy to explain the sudden outpouring of patriotic fervor and a sense of national solidarity because we're under attack. And the sense of national community has always been the strongest in times of war, when the nation as a nation was threatened. But it's interesting to wonder or to ask whether the trend toward privatized understandings of services, but also of individual self-definitions, and the denigration of national government, and the embarrassment about patriotism and national community, whether those general features of our politics will be reversed or only temporarily suspended in the wake of the emotional response to the attack. Well, consider these two moments. This change in the understanding of community at the turn of the century, the advent of communities of consumption on the one hand, and the sudden invocation of national community in the past two weeks on the other. What do those two moments taken together tell us about the, the fate of the democratic experience? 
What I'd like to suggest is that the project of cultivating a sense of national community and of civic obligation has been a great struggle for the last century. That in many ways, we've taken and began at the turn of the century to take an alternative path to community, one based less on citizenship and more on consumption and consumerism. And that the effect over the past century has been to erode the vitality of American democratic life. And the mechanism of erosion, the thing that connects consumer-based identities with the erosion of democratic life is that as the idea and the practice of communities of consumption crowded out stronger civic ideals, the public realm, the idea of the public, was diminished and eroded. But it turns out that a genuinely vibrant democratic public life requires a powerful sense uh, and a, a, a powerful presence of public institutions and shared identities. Why, why is this the case? Well, this carries us beyond these events, beyond these historical moments, just briefly into, into the realm of democratic theory. There is a certain picture of democracy that can flourish perfectly well, at least in principle, with citizens who identify their interests, who vote, who turn out to vote, who vote on the basis of their interests, intelligently, conscientiously. And a certain picture of democracy as a perfectly self-sustaining possibility. Because the point of democracy is to give people collectively what they want, where what they want depends on their own individual interests. But there's another understanding of democracy that's more demanding and that doesn't just consist in voting according to one's interests. On this older conception of democracy, call it a civic conception, or maybe a Republican, small r, Republican conception of democracy. To partake of democratic life isn't just to identify your interests and turn out the polls and vote accordingly. It's to acquire certain habits and dispositions, certain civic virtues, a certain orientation to the common good, and a willingness to engage in public life for the sake of realizing that conception of the common good. Now, these two pictures of democracy, the less demanding consumerist individual, individualist one, and the more demanding civic conception of democracy, these two visions have coexisted, have struggled and tussled throughout the American political experience. The reason the turn of the century was decisive is that the, tr the struggle between these two pictures had a specially urgent form. What was the problem to which the advent of communities of consumption was the solution? The problem was that by the end of the 19th century, the economy had become national but the forms and institutions of political life and of democratic life were still local. They were based in cities and towns and states. And so people drew their political identity from local settings and the democratic structure and institutions available were too small to exercise authority over the economy. 
what to do about that. Well, it was experienced at the time as disempowered. Men and women struggled and debated how to deal with this gap between the scale of economic life, which had become national, and the terms of political identity and democratic institutions, which were still local and not powerful enough to reach and to regulate and to call the democratic account a national economy. There were two primary solutions offered up in the debates of the early 20th century. There were those who said we have to decentralize the economy. Because to have a vast corporate dominated national economy will destroy democracy. So we have to decentralize economic power to make it, to bring it back within the reach of democratically constituted political power. And this was the argument, the, the decentralizing argument of those in the progressive movement like Louis Brandeis, who before he was on the court was a, a progressive reformer and advocate of decentralizing the economy. It was the idea between, behind the antitrust movement. Brandeis favored the antitrust movement primarily because you had to break up the trusts and the monopolies so that democracy could survive. Woodrow Wilson, in the election of 1912, heavily influenced by Brandeis, articulated some of the decentralizing aspirations of that strand of the progressive movement. Then there were others who said that's hopeless. Hopeless nostalgia is unrealistic. Industrial capitalism and its scale are here to stay. And if you want to shore up democracy, what you have to do is to shift power from the states to the national government so you can regulate the national economy so that the, the federal government can face down corporate power. And this was the position of Herbert Crowley, for example, in The Promise of American Life, and also the the view, the new nationalism of Theodore Roosevelt. You're never going to dismantle the scale of industrial capitalism. You better build up the federal government to control it. What they realized, though, Crowley and TR and the nationalizers, is that it wasn't just a matter of pushing power up to the federal government. You had to cultivate a new sense of national political community. You had to get Americans to identify, not just with their states and localities, but above all, with the national political community. Political identity had to be recast. The sense of the community that counts had to be rewritten. And this was, in large part, the debate that animated the 1912 campaign between Woodrow Wilson and T.R. Taft, which was sort of left in the dust, between the decentralizers and the nationalizers. But it was about healing that gap between the scale of economic life and the terms of political identity. Both of those solutions, though, suffered, each suffered from a great defect. Both were very demanding. The decentralizing project seemed hopeless in the face of industrial capitalism and its scale. The nationalizing project, though, demanded so strenuous a sense of national solidarity and community that it seemed impossible to summon and to sustain that sense of community except in fleeting moments, like wartime. And so you saw outpourings of national community sentiment around the time of World War I and World War II and September 11th and the aftermath. But it's very difficult to sustain over the long haul. And that's why we're constantly searching and have been for moral equivalents of war to produce that sense of national purpose and resolve and identity, shared identity. If both of those solutions were subject to these defects, then what was an alternative? There was a third alternative. Though it wasn't articulated by the politicians of today as clearly as the first two, the alternative, the alternative account of community was, don't try to remake Americans into citizens who share a strong sense of national identity. And don't try to dismantle industrial capital. 
invite Americans to look upon politics and political reform through a different sense, a softer, less demanding sense of commonality, namely the identity as consumer. And so we're back to the communities of consumption. And it is really this third vision, though it wasn't as articulated as the first two in the political arguments at the time, it was the third that won the day. The one that Daniel Borson glimpsed in retrospect in that marvelous account. And we see this not only in the political rhetoric of the 20th century, working its way through the New Deal and the, and the Great Society, but even in the political practice. Let me give one brief example of how you can glimpse the shifting understanding of community and the purpose of politics along these lines. The antitrust movement had as one of its animating ideals the decentralizing aspiration of Brandeis for democratic purposes. Now, we still have an antitrust division of the Justice Department today. Antitrust as a public policy has survived the demise of the political ideals that first animated. But antitrust has survived to serve a different vision. What's the point of antitrust uh, legislation today and, and prosecution. It's not to make the economy more amenable to democracy at all. It's to lower consumer prices. What, after all, today is the sin of monopolies? They, they put prices up. And historically, we can pinpoint exactly the moment when this transition took place in the small sphere of antitrust. It was in 1937 that it happened when FDR appointed Thurman Arnold, who had been a professor at Yale Law School, head of the antitrust division at the Justice Department. Thurman Arnold never had any interest in what he saw as a kind of romantic uh, view of antitrust law. He heaped scorn on antitrust law as promulgated by progressives like Brandeis. The curse of bigness, that was Brandeis' phrase, Norman Arnold said, there's no curse of bigness. Business is big, and it's more efficient that way. And yet, Thurman Arnold was a very vigorous enforcer of antitrust. Why? On what grounds? Here's how he put it. And he explained this to the senators who were grilling him at his confirmation here. Americans shouldn't be enlisted to support antitrust out of some fear of bigness, but instead out of interest in, quote, price of pork chops, bread, spectacles, and drugs, and plumbing. 1937, Thurman Arnold, he articulated the new rationale, which was to lower consumer prices, communities of consumption, the third strand of the progressive vision. And it works its way through the course of debate about political economy up through up through really the, the 70s and 80s and 90s. Well, now let's jump ahead to our day. Looking back, why is it that the, that casting community on the basis of the shared interest of consumers, why can't that sustain democracy? How does it, as I alleged, work to erode the public realm. Let's take a few mundane examples looking around us. Consider the fate of public institutions. Well, the most obvious one today, if we want to see how commercial and consumerist understandings crowd out public spaces, the most obvious is probably the role of money in political campaigns. But consider, put even the campaigns inside in the role of money, which is much discussed, put that aside. Consider the, the infrastructure of civic life. 
institutions that may not be connected with the government but nonetheless traditionally perform, perform civic purposes and create a common world, a public realm. Television journalism. We see that the pressure for ratings now, this over the last 15 years, leads to a blurring of the line between news and entertainment. In print journalism, the struggle to increase revenue leads to an erosion of what was once called the wall of separation between the newsroom and the advertising department. Or, how many watched McNeil Lear, the news out of it used to be McNeil Lear, public television? We don't fund it adequately, and so we find creeping commercialism. Can you really tell the difference anymore between recognition of corporate underwriters and commercials? And then there are all those product spin-offs and licensing arrangements for PBS characters. So what, what is once a public institution with distinctive public purposes gradually is captured and colonized by commercialization. Healthcare and the medical profession are being transformed by market norms. For-profit hospitals and HMOs compete with non-profit healthcare providers. There are some non-profit hospitals eager to compete for affluent patients and potential donors who offer now special luxury suites for wealthy patients with gourmet cuisine, concierge service, high-end beauty products in the bathroom. I know about this only because I read about it in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> For-profit prisons. This is part of the privatization trend since the mid-1980s. More and more governments, state and federal government, have entrusted their inmates to the care of for-profit companies. The private prison business is a billion-dollar industry now in the United States. Twenty-seven states in the federal government contract with private companies like the Corrections Corporation of America, wonderful, euphemistic, corporate name, to house their prisoners. Now, part of what animates this is economic inequality, which leads the affluent to secede from public institutions and facilities. And this growing gap between the rich and poor together with the drive toward commercialization of public spaces evacuates public institutions and services and leaves them not as class mixing institutions that bring people together so that they can share a common life, but as leftovers, places where the poor who have no alternative have to find their service. We know about the rise of gated communities. Consider the privatization of security. In 1990, the Labor Department found for the first time that more Americans were employed as private security officers than as public police officers. According to The Economist, Americans now spend about $40 billion a year on public police and $90 billion a year on private security services in residential associations, condominiums, shopping malls, retail stores, and yes, airports. And perhaps one of the most pernicious instances of the creeping commercialization that goes with the consumerist self-understanding is the commercialization of the public schools. We know that private uh, public schools face competition now from for-profit schools. But even the public schools themselves fall prey to the intrusion of commercial advertising. Channel One, have you heard about Channel One? It's a television news program with two minutes of commercials that over 40% of the nation's teenagers watch. 12,000 schools. And so they see ads, captive audience in the school in exchange for free television monitors and, and so on from the company. We don't fund the schools adequately as a public commitment, and so we, in effect, rent the minds and the attention 
of the school children to Burger King and Nike and McDonald's. Well, these are just a few scattered examples, those examples, the shrink wrapping of the buses and the public buses. Have you noticed that? Another example of the commercialism that engulfs what had been public institutions. Naming rights for public, publicly subsidized sports stadiums. Used to be the Boston Garden. They tore that down. Now it's the Fleet Center. Well, each one of these examples taken by itself may seem fairly innocuous, but taken together, it seems to me they illustrate the playing out, the unfolding of a way of understanding citizenship that descends from the image of communities of consumption. And it shows the effect on democratic life when those privatized self-understandings and sources of community provide institutional support for public institutions and public life. I just end by returning to my point of departure, which was the American experience at the turn of the century. Daniel Borston, in describing the new communities of consumption, noticed something about them. He said the modern American was tied if only by the thinnest of threads and by the most volatile, volatile, switchable loyalties to thousands of other Americans in nearly everything he ate or drank or drove or read or used. Old-fashioned political and religious communities now became only two among many new, once unimagined, fellowships. Americans were increasingly held to others not by a few iron bonds, but by countless gossamer webs knitting together the trivia of their lives. Well, I've tried to suggest tonight that those gossamer webs that we created and constructed to hold a continental democratic republic together out of a lack of stronger civic ties have proven fragile, frail, a hundred years now in retrospect. And it seems that the hunger for the patriotism and for the sense of national community and national purpose that September 11, for all its horror, has brought forth that hunger, I think, doesn't just reflect the emotional reaction to a horrific attack. It may also reflect a yearning for forms of community and of public life that are sturdier more demanding, but sturdier than the gossamer threads of consumerist notions of citizenship. Thank you very much. in the fields of law, education, social history, and literature. 
culminating with this year's uh, as Library of the Library of Congress. It is Dr. Borstein's role that I want to, um, that we are honoring tonight. He is a master weaver who has taken the myriad strands of our nation's history and woven them into a rich tapestry of the American experience. He has accomplished this by prodigious scholarship, paired with a gift for articulating his vision of the past and its relevance to the present and future, all in layman's prose. His writings are as timely today as they were when he began more than 50 years ago. Some of you may remember Peter Jennings um, uh, quoting from Dr. Borston's book, The MH, uh, during his coverage of the September 11th event. We recognize that our award is but one of many that Dr. Borston has received during his lifetime. Nevertheless, we're delighted to be presenting the Ruth Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History to Dr. Borston. But by so doing, we honor Mrs. Miller's commitment to the role of remembrance in our lives and the Concord Library's role in preserving our past, providing for our community's intellectual needs, and anticipating the future. Now, at this time, I'd like Dr. Borston to come forward. And as he does, I want to say a word or two about this award we're giving him. When the first permanent library building, a neo-Gothic structure, was built in 1873, it was surrounded by a matching iron fence whose posts were topped by people who like this one. During the 1930s renovation of the library, the fence was removed and only the finials were saved. A tradition was begun and continues today whereby retiring trustees and others who have made outstanding contributions on behalf of the library are awarded a finial. Dr. Morrison, given your love of books and your outstanding contributions on behalf of all libraries, we decided this is a fitting symbol of our so, on behalf of the friends of the Concord Free Public Library, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Ruth Bradley Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History. Chisel a personal or definitive view of the past in granite. 
iridescence of the past, the iridescence of the past, fully aware that it will have a new and unsuspected iridescence in the future. Thank you. enjoy some cake, and have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, purchase some books that Dr. Borston and um, Dr. Sandel will be signing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now which one are you buying? Which one? To Mike. Coupon Discovering is a great book. Did you hear him? Yeah. Where's your question? Oh, no, I mean, not, oh, no, not here with the catch. That's fine. Just <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Boston, at Hebrew College, and at Brandeis. All right. Glenn has an idea of the Hebrew Paradise. His father was a fireman. He's a very enthusiastic man. I want to ask you a question about his father. Thank you so much for your wonderful comments. Very. I always heard that his father. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. To some degree, the DNA. Legal defense. Oh, very much. That is true. After he was in, he carried the wedding. You're coming.